Hey, I'm grateful to be able to be here with you this morning to come and to speak. Uh, Chris is away on some much uh, needed vacation. And uh, I know, before we even get started, uh, it's a little hot. Um, we, we've had the AC on since six. It's working, it's doing its best. But trust me, it's, it's a little hotter, I think, up here than it is out there. And so I will try to be brief. That might urge us on so we can, but we'll make it through. The Lord will supply for our needs, which is what we'll see that today. Hey, um, it's good to see you. Welcome to Wellspring Church. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Cameron. I serve on staff as one of the pastors here, and I am grateful to be able to speak to you this morning. Uh, at Wellspring Church, we exist to connect people to Christ, the wellspring of life, to help them walk with him for a lifetime, and so that we might follow in his example, in the example of Christ, in all of his ways, and as the Bible says, we might live lives of purpose and that we would take hold of life that is truly life. And so that's what we're about today. We are going to try our best to take hold of life that is really life. Um, before I jump in, I am curious. Hey, Victor, can you turn this down a little bit, man? Thank you, man. Hey, uh, before we jump in, I am uh, curious. How many of you in the room would consider yourselves to be savers? How many of you, with your money, would consider yourselves to be savers? How many of you are spenders? <laughs> How many of you savers married a spender? Yeah, see, that's kind of how it works, right? There's savers and there's spenders, and it seems like the savers always end up marrying the spenders, the spenders always end up marrying the savers. At least that's how it worked out for me. Uh, I, by my nature, am more of a saver, and my wife is more of a spender. It works out, you know, we keep each other balanced. She makes sure that we have some fun, and I make sure that we can afford to have some fun. And so <laughs> that is the give and the take of the saving and of the spending. I've always kind of been this way. I remember from a very early age, I saved all of my birthday money, I saved all of my Christmas money, I never spent any of it, like never. I just, my parents opened up a bank account me, for me and I just put it in there and I thought, you know, by the time I'm like 16 or 17, I could like buy a car or something. You know, like I was like, I had very big ambitions. You know, unfortunately, when you turn 18 and you realize you only have, you know, $600 in your bank account after your years and years of saving, it really doesn't add up to that much. But anyways, I've always been a saver. And uh, that's interesting. They, the guys, the good people out at Stanford University, they did a test. It's very well known. It's called the marshmallow test. Anybody heard of that? The marshmallow test. What they do is they take some kids, they put some kids in a room, and they put a marshmallow in front of them. A marshmallow, a piece of like an M&M, a piece of candy. And they told the kids, okay, uh, you can have this marshmallow now, or if you wait 10 minutes or so, we're going to come back and I'll give you two marshmallows. And so what they found was very interesting. Some of the kids, you know, they just took the marshmallow right away, they ate it. Uh, some of the kids would wait and they'd stare at the marshmallow and they'd look at it and they'd go, ah, but I'm gonna get two marshmallows. And then their faith was rewarded and then the guys brought out and then they got two marshmallows. And so the interesting part of the study is they followed up with these people years later, all the kids they did in this test. And what they found was that kids who waited for the marshmallow were better at delayed gratification. They found out that those children were tended to be more of the savers. And the kids who ate the marshmallow right away tended to be more of the spenders. And so I empathize, I resonate from a very young age. I feel like I've always kind of been a saver. It's just part of who I am. And that is not either right or wrong. You know, it's, if you're a saver or if you're a spender, that's okay. Um, but we're gonna look at a story today. We're in a series called Stories Worth Telling. And we're gonna look at a story. We're gonna look at what's called a parable that Jesus taught about a rich man who was a saver. See, he spent all of his life caught up in what we might call the endless pursuit of more. 
He caught, his life was caught up in saving and gathering and reaping and the endless pursuit of more. And he spent his life doing this, but in the end, he was found to be poor because he was not rich toward God. This is what Jesus teaches. And so today we're gonna take a look at the story and we're gonna see what God has to say about it, what God has to say about money and how we manage and steward all of the wealth that God has entrusted to us. Now, a couple of prefacing comments on this. I know that as soon as I say that, a couple of you kind of check out because you don't really wanna come on the 4th of July and hear somebody talk about money. And that's okay, that's fair. In fact, I don't really wanna talk about it. Um, see, money has a tendency to get in our business. You know, it gets in my business, it kind of gets in your business, and if we're honest, we don't really want to think about it all that much, and that's okay, uh, but we have to, because the truth of the matter is Jesus, in the stories, in the parables, he had a lot to say about money, and if we're gonna be faithful to teach the Bible and the whole of the Bible, then we have to look at what Jesus says about our wealth and about how we manage it. Um, because 11 out of the 39 parables that Jesus told were related to money and to wealth. Uh, 15% of everything he said actually had something to do with money. 15% of everything that Jesus said had something to do with money money, and that is a pretty high percentage, I would say. You know, if I, if every conversation we had, if 15% of the time that I was talking about money, I imagine that not very many of you would want to talk to me. You know, I would probably not have very many friends. Uh, but this is what Jesus did. Why did he do it? Because Jesus understood something that many of us are blind to. He understood that the God of this world is Money, And in Matthew chapter six, this is what Jesus taught. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and he will despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so, hear me clearly. When Jesus is talking about money, he's trying to get to something deeper. See, Jesus isn't, whenever Jesus talks about money, he's trying to get down to the deeper issues of the heart. It's about who your master is, and it's about what you are mastered by. And so, uh, if I just skip to the end, I'll, I'll spoil it for you. Money makes a really terrible master, right? Money makes a bad God. And so let's look at the parable and see what Jesus would have to teach to us. And so let me set the scene. So a large crowd is coming and is gathering to Jesus and he begins to teach them. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God, which is probably his favorite thing to talk about. He's talking about uh, what he has come to do, things of eternal significance. He has his eyes set towards Jerusalem. He's thinking about the cross and how he is going to go to it to make a way for us to be right with God. And he's talking to the crowds. And in the middle of this, somebody interrupts Jesus and says, yeah, Jesus, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, that's great. But what about my money? My brother received an inheritance. Tell him to split it with me. And so Jesus says to this man, okay, we'll do that. Let me tell you the story about a fool. Would you stand with me? We're gonna read from chap uh, Luke chapter 12. Here is, this is the word of the Lord. It says this in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, the crowd, watch out. Be on guard against all kind of greed, for life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones and there I will store up my surplus 
grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. And then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, explaining this parable, he says this, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or what about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body is more than clothes. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out and treasures in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, you can take a seat. So let's consider the story. Let's consider the parable. The parable is usually called the rich fool. But really, that is more of God's verdict on the situation, more than ours. Uh, from the human perspective, this man is a hardworking farmer. He is good at what he does. Uh, and there is n- this passage leaves no concept that he has ever lied or cheated anyone out of wealth. He has worked hard. And then one year, he is supplied with an abundant harvest. His hard work pays off. And so what does he do? He says to himself, I'm gonna take my abundant harvest and I'm going to put it away. I'm gonna retire early and I'm gonna enjoy the rest of my life. He kind of sounds like he's living the dream. <laughs> I mean, this is what we're all trying to do, right? Don't we want it? We retire early, we work hard, and then we get to enjoy the life and the things that we have worked for. It kind of sounds like this man is pursuing a lot of the same things that we pursue. So why does God call him a fool? Notice what the rich man says. He kind of has this monologue, and this is what he says. What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. He said this, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. The rich man thinks that he has a storage problem. He has too much. He thinks he has a storage problem. But in reality, he has a couple of other problems. He's got the problem of his greed and he has the problem of God, and he has the problem of death. In in these two verses, this man's monologue, there are three my's, there are four I's. See, God does not call him a fool because he worked hard and he acquired wealth. That is a good thing. God calls him a fool because of what he did with the wealth that God gave him. A man's a farmer. Who made him wealthy? God did. God supplied the man. He planted the seed, but God gave him the wealth. He brought the growth. And he learned too late that all of the things that he had were on a temporary loan from God. He lived his life without regard for God, and he lived his life without regard for the needs of his neighbor. He was greedy. And that brings us to his final problem, which is death, right? He acquires this wealth, and then what happens? God says, tonight, your life will be demanded of you, and who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Despite our best efforts at medical intervention, the mortality rate is still 100%. And the rich man forgot this. He forgot that everyone dies. We don't know how long we have to live. And so who is going to get what he has left behind? And so the parable ends here, but you can only imagine this man's memorial service, this funeral service. Parking lot full of luxury cars. Family and friends say polite things during the eulogy. Maybe they file by and they look at his casket and say, oh, he looks so natural. Yet, 
moments later, perhaps in the parking lot, siblings and sons and daughters and cousins are out there arguing about who's going to get the big barns and who is going to get all of the things that this man has stored up for himself. And they may never talk to each other again except through their lawyers. And so you can also just imagine people in the back. This is the richest man they ever knew asking to themselves, whispering, how much do you think he was worth? And Jesus is asking the same question. How much do you think the rich man was worth? So what does Jesus say? He says, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed, for life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. No one can serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. So we must be on guard against greed. This is what Jesus is trying to teach the rich man. We must be on guard against greed continually and persistently because the God of this world is money. And if we are not mindful about how we handle our finances and our wealth, we will bow to the mastery of money and we will turn to it to meet all of the needs that we think we have that only God can supply. The master of money. So today, I want to give us a couple of things, just a couple of things we can apply. How can we be on guard against greed? This is what Christ would ask of us. And the first one is this. To be on guard against greed, we must reject the lie of materialism. We must reject the lie of materialism. And the lie of materialism is subtle. I don't think many of us would think that we are materialists. But yet, it is underneath the surface, subtly affecting so many of the decisions we make every day. And the lie of the materialism is, is, it's this. More of what you don't have is more of what you need. That's the lie of materialism. More of what you don't have is more of what you need. Here's what I know. We live in an age of affluence, yet we never seem to have enough. This generation has grown accustomed to a higher standard of living than any other generation that has come before us, yet most of us don't consider ourselves to be rich. Uh, I was looking into this a little bit this week, and the good people at Barna did a study. They asked some people, they did a survey, and they asked people, how much does it take for you, how much would it take for you to be rich, for you to consider yourself to be rich? And they got some interesting responses. Uh, And you see the responses varied based on the people who they asked. You ask a person who makes $30,000 a year, they found that those people said, well, I think it would take about $75,000 a year for me to be rich. And for those of us who make $75,000 a year, (laughs) it doesn't feel too rich, does it? Right? So we ask the people who make $50,000 a year, and they ask them, how much does it take? And they said, well, I think it'll take somewhere around $100,000 a year. They asked the people who are making that much money, making $100,000 a year, how much does it take to be rich? Well, it probably takes somewhere around $5 million in assets to be rich. Someone once asked John Rockefeller what he thought it took to be rich. How much is enough? They asked one of the richest men in the world. And he replies, just one more dollar. How much does it take? How much is enough? Just one more dollar. That's all it takes. That's all it takes for all of us. See, this pursuit of wealth, it doesn't seem to ever end. We never seem to get to the end. There's always this feeling inside of us that what I need is just a little bit more. Just a little bit more house, a little bit more car, a little bit more money, and then I will be happy. Then I'll be satisfied. Then I will have what I need. So how much does it take for you? How much is enough. And that's some lie of materialism. What I don't have, once I have it, then I'll be happy. But the truth is that material wealth does not, in fact, bring happiness. This is a truth we see taught in the Bible, and it's a truth that we've just lived out in human experience. Uh, A couple of things we can look at from some wealthy men. Uh, W.H. Vanderbilt says this, The care of 200 million is enough to kill anyone. There's no pleasure in it. I have made my millions, and they have brought me no happiness. John Rockefeller. Millionaires seldom smile. Andrew Carnegie. And I was happier 
when doing a mechanic's job. Henry Ford. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, we hear from one of the wisest and wealthiest men. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit do they have to the owners except to be a feast for their eyes? The sleep of the laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Oh man, it's a good thing I'm not rich. It's a good thing I'm not rich. I'm gonna have some problems, right? I'd have some things to think about. I'd have some money to manage. But that's just the thing, isn't it? Right? See, we live in the age of affluence. Uh, if we consider our position globally, and if we consider our position historically, the truth of the matter is we are in fact very wealthy, uh, even if we don't feel like it sometimes. Um, now, I don't want to diminish what some of you have experienced, even in this previous year, uh, financial hardships and struggles to lose a job, to lose a house. Those are very real things. And that kind of struggling and suffering, it brings pain and contention and it is hard and is difficult. However, the reality is if you have food in your fridge and if you have clothes in your closet and if you drove a car here today, you are richer than 80% of the world's population. 80%. And if we consider our position historically back to the time of Jesus' day, we live in a kind of abundance that would be hard for them to understand. Jesus taught his followers that they should not worry about what they should eat or about what they should wear because God will supply for their needs. So we stand in front of our closets and we think that we have nothing to wear. We stand in front of our refrigerators and we have nothing to eat because they're, they're full of food, but we have nothing to eat. So what do we do? We go out to eat, and then we get some Chick-fil-A. Or maybe we don't want Chick-fil-A. Maybe we want something else, and we get something else. And now you're thinking you want Chick-fil-A, but it's Sunday. So I'm sorry that I planted that in you. You can't have it. <laughs> but see, that's the thing, right? We live in a kind of abundance. We have options. We have clothes. We have so much, yet we feel like we never have enough, and we don't feel rich. So what do we do, the rich people that we are? Well, we reject the lie of materialism. We reject the lie that material possessions will satisfy the longings of our soul, and we embrace the reality that everything we have is a gift from God. It is a blessing. It is a blessing that has been entrusted to us, and we are to be stewards. We are to be wise stewards and to invest what has been given to us into kingdom purposes and make good use of it so that when the master returns, we will have something to present to him. What have you done with your life? What have you done with your money? The master is coming. What are you doing with what God has entrusted to you? Are you storing it up? My barns, my crops, I'll build bigger ones. Or are we wise stewards of what God has given to us? And this is how we guard against greed. The second way we guard against greed is by maintaining an eternal perspective. See, the mortality rate, as we've discussed, is still 100%. This is true for the rich fool, it's true for us. And in the end, you can't take it with you. You've probably heard the old adage, uh, you'll never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, <laughs> except maybe in this photo. I don't, know <laughs> I don't know what the plan is. I mean, the guy's going on the ground. He's going to need a pretty big grave <laughs> for the U-Haul. But see, you'll never, you can't take it with you, right? You can't take it with you. What does God say to the rich man? He says, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? You see, by maintaining an eternal perspective, maintaining an eternal perspective is realizing that this place is not our home. This world, where we live, it's not our home. The Bible says that we are sojourners, that we are pilgrims, that we are aliens on the earth. Our true citizenship is in heaven. 
And where we choose to store our treasure has a lot to do with where we view our citizenship. It's where we view our home. If we forget that our home is in heaven, we inevitably start to make our home here on earth. We will start to use our wealth to get comfortable and we will see our lives. But when we see our lives with an eternal perspective, we are freed from the fleeting pleasures of this life and instead can find deep satisfaction in the things that matters for eternity. And what are the things that matter for eternity? Christ says, store up treasures in heaven. And so this is the third thing. We guard against greed by storing up treasures in heaven. It's true that we can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. We can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. Um, Look at what Jesus told his disciples. He tells the parable and then he explains it. Um, He says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we cannot take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. We can store up treasures in heaven. That's an idea I got from uh, Randy Alcorn. He wrote a great book. He's a pastor and an author. He wrote a book called The Treasure Principle. Um, Chances are, if I say anything that sounds really good today, it probably came from that book. Um, or a book by Andy Stanley called Fields of Gold. Uh, There's really too much to be said about uh, money and wealth and finances. So I would highly recommend uh, reading those books. And so what does Jesus say? He says to sell your possessions and give to the poor. In doing so, you will lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. And so that we ask the question, okay, Jesus, what should I sell? How much should I sell? Do I sell some? Do I sell it all? What do you want me to do? And Jesus says, maybe. (laughs) See, there was at least one man who Jesus told to sell it all, and that was the rich young ruler. There was another man named Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. He extorted people for money, and he came to faith in Christ And when he did, he said, Jesus, I'm gonna give half of everything that I've ever made and I'm gonna give it to the poor. And any money that I've cheated out of anyone, I'm gonna give it back to them and even more. And then there were the disciples in Acts who sold the possessions that they had so that they could provide for those who were in need. Um, There was a man named Barnabas who sold a field so that he could give the money to the disciples for the work of ministry. And there was a poor widow who had two small coins And she gave them to God. And Jesus praised her for it. And he said, she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. And so I have to ask the question, why why sell? Why sell our possessions? Why not just go to the bank and get out some money and give that? Uh, Well, I thought about this for some time and I kind of came to two thoughts. One, Jesus is talking to people who don't have bank accounts. See, the people who Jesus is talking to, they don't have money to just go and get and give. They're poor. In order to give, they must sell. So they must sell what they have so that they can give to others. But what about the wealthy? Well, for the wealthy, when we sell what we have, we are freed up from the attachments that we have to material possessions. And so we sell what we have, we are freed. And so in selling, We dethrone the idol of materialism and wealth and money so that we can worship God. How we manage our money, it's a heart issue. It's about who your master is and about what you are mastered by. And so when we sell, when we give, when we are generous, we're laying our yes on the table and we're saying, I don't serve this. This world is not my home. I serve God. And so we dethrone that idol so that we can rightly worship Um, Every year, for the last three years, I've taken a trip down to uh, Rocky Point to do work with a ministry called uh, One Mission. And so One Mission, if you don't know, several of you in this room have been on these trips. Um, I go because it's one of the ways that I guard against uh, greed and one of the ways that I guard against materialism. See, what One Mission does is they provide housing and give people a chance 
who are living in poverty the opportunity to earn a home by serving their community. So these people, what they're doing is they're building homes in the barrios, people who have nothing. I mean, the things they live in, if you've, if you've never seen poverty like this, it's, it's cardboard and it's plywood and it's sheet metal roofs, maybe, on the dirt. And these are where these people are living. And so you go in and you see this and you got in, some guy in Phoenix years ago said, gosh, somebody's gotta do something about this. Somebody has, has got to give these people some reasonable shelter. And so he started a ministry that would build homes in Rocky Point for these people who are in need. And it's supplied by the donations and the giving of people here in this valley. We give money to the ministry and then we ourselves go. And we are the volunteers who go for a weekend and we build these homes. We build homes for these people in the barrios of Mexico. And I remember my, my first year that I went and I did one of these trips, I just, I was so surprised. I was so taken back by the kind of poverty that I saw. When you see that kind of poverty, it kind of gives you the right perspective, doesn't it? Makes you realize what you have, makes you a little bit more grateful, makes you realize that you are blessed and what you've been given by God. But I remember there was a family, so what we do is we go down for the weekend and we work alongside the family, the family that's receiving the house. And so we're working and we're working and you know, at the end of the weekend we finish the house and it's this great big celebration and we get to give them a, the key to the new house and we say, you know, it's not much, but this is what we have to give. We hope that you're blessed by it. Here's a key to your new home and they are so glad, right? And so I remember being impacted though, not so much by that, but the last day we were there, the family provided us a meal to the people who were working on the home, right? We come to give them something, they give, they in turn, they give us something. And so this family who lives in such poverty, and it's, <laughs> I mean, they work every day and they make a dollar that day working eight, 10 hours. And so this family, what they do out of their poverty, they provide us a meal, they got us a cake, like a nice one. Like it got us like a nice big cake, a couple of liters of soda and some other chips and some other snacks and things. I mean, this was a lavish gift. They must have saved for days and weeks to be able to provide us with this. And I was taken back by the generosity of those who had nothing. And I thought to myself, what am I doing with what I have, with the wealth that God has entrusted to me? These people <laughs> outdoing me in generosity by a mile because out of what they didn't have, they gave richly to me. And so we are called to be stewards of what we have, to be rich in good deeds and to generous and be willing to share with those who are in need. One last scripture. 1 Timothy chapter six, Paul says this, command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up for themselves a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is what God wants for us. God wants for us to take hold of the life that is truly life, to get to the end and realize that we live for more than just ourselves, that our money that we kept, it wasn't just kept for ourselves, but that we gave it away that we spent our time well, we spent our resources well, we went and we served those who were in need. And in doing so, we lay up for ourselves treasure, things that really matter. We make a difference for eternity. And Christ says that when we do these things, there will be a reward in heaven for us. We experience that reward here and now through the joy of generosity, and we will experience that reward one day when we are in heaven with him. And five minutes after we die, will realize the way we should have lived. And so, here at Wellspring, we want to be able to preach the Bible clearly. 
and to understand it fully. And so the issue of money and how we manage our wealth, that's such a huge part of our spirituality. It is inseparable. And so would we be good stewards? Would we be good money managers? Would we be people who are generous? And so that when we get to the end of our life, we're not found to be poor in the things of God. Let's pray.